and you, that's how you, you look playing poker with your, your fist on there and your little hoodie. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the completely unnecessary podcast for 2022. Yeah. Tuesday, January 4th, alongside poker faced Ian Ferguson. That's right. I'm chubby faced Pat Country. Uh, on the show today, got them dimples. We'll be discussing. You can see the deep dimples better now, even when you're face to face. We'll be yeah. discussing uh, Goldeneye returning possibly as a game, the eBay Collection Hub, which was announced, and we'll do a Patreon uh, poll choice, 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 as well as as we'll get back to the the voicemails, uh, Ian. Uh, you do not have the best new year. You can hear all about it on the exclusive podcast, patreon.com slash CU podcast. We discussed our, our, our just, we're just down on new year's in general, even before Ian's been sick. Yeah. Um, I finally got back into uh, San Diego uh, yesterday morning, actually around one thirty AM jumped right, right back into work for seven fucking hours. Uh, I'm still miserable. I don't know what to say. I feel like shit. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm improving. Um, not as miserable. You're not as, not as miserable, but man, this is, this is a, uh, this is long. I think the only times I've been sicker for longer are, uh, like 12 years ago, I had pneumonia for like a month and a half. And then, um, obviously I had my gut issues, but that was more of a physical issue. Uh, All I can say is like, not not I, I you can say get vax you can say wear a mask whatever i'm just gonna say you don't want this you you don't want this um i this i'm I'm not trying to call anyone out here i can't fucking believe magfest is still going on this weekend and i can't believe there are still people some people i consider friends actively looking forward to magfest and i realize i i'm i'm sick and i'm getting over it but like that uh, puts a new perspective on it. And I think you and I have been pretty cautious the whole time about it. Um, and I, I hate to be one of those people who's like, you know, when it happens to you, suddenly you talk a bit more about it, but having this as a person who is vexed, not boosted granted. And I missed my booster because I got delayed in Buffalo. Um, I don't think going to MAGFest this weekend is a real smart thing. If you don't like being sick. Other than that, yeah, I got back. Uh, flight was delayed a couple of times. I, the, I had the worst. I, the worst layover you can have when you fly back from the East coast, when you fly back from New York and it happens sometimes is they take you from Buffalo back to Newark and then fly you cross country. They go Southeast. Yeah. They have to go west. So it's like, you're not even going towards your destination. Isn't that they, fun? They wind up the slingshot and then let you go. Yeah. It's like and they can't even get you to Chicago, get you a little bit closer. They can't even do that. <laughs> it makes the trip. It makes the trip so long because you get about an hour out to you know newark uh 46 minutes but you know an hour all said from take off to touchdown and then you fly straight back with no breaks six hours in a plane is is nuts and i had an exit row but like i just i hate flying man it's so bad at the three hour mark at, at the three hour mark i start doing stretches to try to like alleviate cramps and that's all i do for the last three hours is just stretch I stood for like 45 minutes. I'm, like, I'm just going to stand up because I had an aisle seat. Mm-hmm. Anyway, my email there <laughs> it made the, made the sound. Yeah. I um, it. Yeah. It's uh, f- flying's fun, but I can't imagine during this with everyone. It's like, probably like uh, who, who's, who's got, who's got the Omicron or who's, you know, right. But you know, you follow CDC guidelines though. So you you were good to go. Yeah, I followed all the guidelines. I think I was beyond most of the guidelines by a few days. So, I, you know, I shouldn't have been contagious. Hopefully no one caught anything. But I'm home, back to work, trying to get back to something normal. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, my New Year's Eve was spent finishing up an NES Punk video. Oh. Okay. Game Boy Christmas games. Now, before you say, Pat... You know, you're always late on these Christmas videos. I wasn't on the one a couple of years ago. I, I got it done two days before Christmas and came out Christmas Eve. Um, I had an excuse. I I did a flea market madness, but then I went to the Sacramento convention. I'm not blaming the Sac Gamers Expo. Thanks for having me out. 
But if it wasn't for that convention, I would have had it out a lot earlier than, you know, because that took like three days out of my life. Uh, so, so, but I, I figured I'm going to do this because now I don't know when I'm going to have the time to do the next one. And going through the process again, and it was only a 15, well, 14 minute video, I reviewed Home Alone, Home Alone 2. Uh, the Grinch, and then Santa Claus Jr., which is an interesting European exclusive uh, platformer. Uh, it takes a lot out of me doing those videos. It takes a lot out of me. Yeah, I uh, bet. And it's taken more and more out of me. Uh, actually, the, the the Halloween one did not take as much out of me. I think it was just December was such a grind. And there was so much going on uh, that, and the fact that I just did a Flea Market Madness the week before and finished it, and went to the convention and then Christmas week was nuts. I just was like, I'm glad people like them, but they take a lot out of me, out of my, like, this isn't like how I did them 10 years ago. And I had all that manic energy and I could do them like one a month. You know, sure. I just don't, I just don't. Plus I have so much more going on anymore. And it was almost like a, a, 10 years ago, I still had my crappy day job. It was a respite from the day job to do those it was like my, it, now it's now that it's the job it's not so much it was an entertaining outlet at the time and plus right. there was no expectations or pressure you know i didn't have to worry about if the quality wasn't up to snuff or you know to, now i'm a lot more particular about the writing and things like that sure i'm i, I i'm more judgy on my own stuff it's like oh this is just isn't just me doing like a, a crappy arnold schwarzenegger impression for my commando video and that's like what like half of the video is you know what i mean like this is I, I've evolved a little bit. <laughs> a little sure. Bit. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. But either way, I'm glad people like it. So check it out. It's the uh, Christmas Game Boy games. Eno will, will watch it because he loves Game Boy games. Yeah, I'm absolutely going to watch it someday. <laughs> <laughs> someday. <laughs> On my deathbed, I'll be like, Ian. Well, I was I it? was going to ask you how those Christmas games were, but I felt like that would be rude since there's a video I can watch that will tell me. So perhaps I will watch those. I can... I can uh, the home alone home alone is here's the thing i don't have a lot of game boy experience so i don't have like i i don't have like my my what's my average game boy game versus what's a great i haven't played enough but just playing those four i know that home alone 2 is miserable oh yeah it is i i have not i have not exaggerated when i've talked about how bad home alone is and i'm pretty sure the game boy one is the same as the nes one not not the original the sequel is the first one is different. Oh, yeah. No, the, the, the sequel. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. That's what I mean. Yeah. The, the, the first Home Alone on Game Boy is like a fetch quest that isn't great, but is like, okay, you can have fun playing this if you want to get in the mood. The sequel is so badly designed. It's awful. I, I couldn't wrap my head around like, okay, you get it. The sliding knee attack. It takes out some of the enemies, but not all, but not of, them. all of them. Yeah. So you don't know which ones you can be taken out until you die. And I'm just like, that alone is bad game game design. That alone. Uh, and then then there, you get to, this is spoilers for the video, you get to the third stage, which is the, um, like the big house. It's like the uncle's house or whatever. And you have no clue where to go in terms of like this labyrinth. Uh -huh. And there's like some doors will open right away. Then you go through them. Then you have to backtrack. There's like a few different levels. You go through a door, you come to another floor. They have like letters in the door, but then some will like magically blink that you unlock them, but you had no idea how you unlock them. There's, there's keys for like a couple of doors, but not most. And then like, in order to get out of this, you have to find a key that's through the floorboards of a certain section that you have no fucking idea that that's you get to fall through there. You yeah. have no idea unless you did it by accident. Yep. I looked in the man. I looked in the, even the manual, the PDF. I'm like, there's no clues in the manual. There's no clues in the game. Yeah, no, it's um, it's miserable, dude. <laughs> had a, and the gameplay know. styles constantly change. Like once you get out of the hotel, the game is like it's just a platformer. Well, once you oh, well, no, that's right. Then there's the burning house. Yeah, it, it's it's a bad game, dude. There's it's no, really no, really no. awful. There's no burning house, but not the burning house, like the abandoned house. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. It's, yeah, it's yeah, okay. Like, it's 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 like a hotel, another hotel, basically. Yes, where you just go through all the different doors, but then after that, there's like two more minutes of game. Where it's like you 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 run down the down the road and you just knee slide rats and dogs in the face, then you jump up the Christmas tree and that's it. And I'm just like, this game fucking sucks. Yep. Like it, it, it angered me. It wasn't the worst game in the world, but it angered me on so many weird levels. Yeah, <laughs> so much yeah. so that like the Grinch was like, oh, the Grinch is fun. It's a weird stealth maze hybrid game that you, it's pretty unique. Um, 
And that was fun, challenging, but fun. And then Santa Claus Jr. is like a very not not super outstanding, but very, very well polished platformer. Like it, it's just a standard platform, but it's very well polished on all fronts. So I'm like, okay, that's a good game. So like I don't have enough Game Boy experience to like do it, but I do know Home Alone 2 is fucking awful because of that. Like and so if we do if we do a Game Boy guidebook, I I just reviewed Home Alone, Home Alone 2. So those are out of the way. <laughs> I can write <laughs> You button, Ian. You button. Yeah, I, well, it's like the first one I missed. Eat me. Um, <laughs> wow. Oh yeah, the graphics on the Santa Claus Junior look kind of decent. Oh yeah, they look good, and the and the, and the the animation is good. The music is good. Yeah, it's just, it's just a fun little game. Like you can probably get through it in like twenty five minutes if you're like a, a pretty good at platformers. But if I if I re ran it a second time, I'd get through it quick. I think the first time it took me like forty five to an hour because it was like okay, well, I'm not used to it. Sure. There's some challenging elements to it. Yeah. You see the, the Hidden Palace uh, uh, New Year's announcement? I did. It was huge. They released uh, a whole ton, a whole heap of, Big news. Uh, of prototypes, um, I believe some of which that uh, our friend Frank Cifaldi had been holding on to uh, for quite some time. The collective held on to these for like one big release. That's what it sounded like. I don't think that it was on purpose. I think it was just things just kind of got backed up and they finally... <laughs> Um, excuse me, got rid of all of them or got all of them out there. 178 prototypes was from the tweet to share with you for various cart based systems. Almost 30 of them are prototypes of unreleased games. 30 unreleased, 30, some of which haven't been seen before. And then in their tweet, uh, they brought up the fact that thanks to Frank Cifaldi and, and St- our pal Steve Lynn uh, from gamehistory.org for the bulk of the releases. Big thanks to Art Ventano for sharing some nice prototypes as well. Um, and a shout out to Mark, uh, Marco Mora for, for Robocop Cup on Game Boy Advance. Uh, then anonymous donors, and they fa- thanked a bunch of other people like Force of uh, Force of Illusion, NES, SNES Central, you know, Gaming Alexandria, like a bunch of people uh, contributed to, to these in some way, shape, or form. The one thing they point out there was an unreleased uh, John Madden Game Boy prototype. Yeah, um, that was interesting. Um, also, this Mare Wars for the uh, Super Nintendo looks interesting. It was like some sort of Mode 7 underwater um, shooter uh, that looks really, really neat. Um, there was also uh, a RoboCop for the GBA, which I thought was interesting, oh, and a San, Fr- San Francisco Rush for the Game Boy Color. Um, lots of, yeah, kind of neat stuff. Nothing that I think is you know uh earth shattering but um definitely stuff that's interesting for people who pay attention to it uh the san francisco rush extreme racing prototype kind of appealed to me just because they um do it for and it's like pseudo 3d so it reminds me a bit of uh hard driving which i always i've always kind of liked so definitely stuff to to look at and is this a turbo graphics prototype tv sports baseball huh uh, I know those also came out on the computer um, in some degree. I think like Amiga had some of those TV sports ones. It would have been on the TurboGrafx-16. It's very rare to see a TurboGrafx uh, prototype. And this, is, this was unreleased, obviously. We had, I, we had world-class baseball. Uh, which, which, right. Um, I mean, these, these TV sports series are hit or miss. The basketball game is miserable compared to um, taking it to the hoop. Um, but TV sports hockey was really good. TV sports football was solid because I had that. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I want to check this game out now, obviously. Put it on the Crick's uh, flash drive and play it. Oh, these are clickable. Fan- fantastic. So, yeah, this is, this is great news for preservation. Spock goes to Hollywood, 32X prototype version. There you go. Oh, that's neat. I don't think I actually checked that one out. Uh, Payne Stewart Pro Golf, RBI Baseball 95, Mega Drive prototype. Uh, Mike Dicka's Mike Dicka. Uh, big play football would that have been uh, Super Nintendo's quarterback scramble? Um, that would have been oh, that's the NES one. I thought we that one was out before. Maybe this is a different version of it. I thought that one was was that was that one released for unreleased US port of quarterback scramble? Okay, so th- this is before they changed it to Mike Ditka, which was also you know th- th- that was like a homebrew uh, release you could have gotten at some point. So now there's some good stuff here. It, it makes it. When when you release this many at one time, especially ones we never heard of, it really it really goes to show how how much work went into stuff that you know you worked on this these projects for maybe a year year and a half and they just never came out. Yeah, or these ports. 
a 32 X uh, spot goes to Hollywood. There you go. What other system was that on? Was that on Genesis? Uh, I believe it was. I think it was actually on Super Nintendo too. At least I thought it was, but I never played that one. Uh, I don't think. Uh, it was yeah. It was on. It was on everything. It was on Saturn. Oh, Saturn, PlayStation, and Genesis. No Super. Okay, Super that's was it. a regular one. Super, Super was a cool spot then. That's right. Uh, so yeah, no, this is a uh, this is some good stuff. Check it out, Ian. Um, the, how about the Nintendo Game Boy aging cartridge? The aging yeah, I- cartridge. I did not click on that one yet. That's interesting. A prototype of Nintendo Game Boy Agent cartridge for the Game Boy. Officially Game Boy Agent cartridge to test retail hardware. Oh, it's like a test cart. Okay. Oh, as in the, the system's aging. Ah, oh, uh, gotcha. Great. And they show like a Super Mario 3 sprite on the Game Boy, which is interesting, with like the Tanuki suit. It, it just it shows like alleyway Super Mario Land um, screens on there. That's, that's cool test cart stuff. All right. Yeah, I always like test carts. Okay, so check out the list. Uh, once, uh, like I said, it's on. It's on. Uh, go to the Wayback Machine and search Hidden Palace. Otherwise, wait for the site to come back up. You know, it's never down, Ian. UltimateNintendo.com. It's never down. Good, uh, clean, uh, quick, like that one. You need the Wayback Machine to uh, access RBI baseball stickers, CU podcast pins, limited T-shirts. We sold the the last XL one last week, actually, and we also have uh, obviously certain guidebooks uh, for sale. As well, uh, I'm going to be on Cameo Wednesday, Cameo.com. Not Cameo, I always get that fucked up. Uh, I'll be on Twitch Wednesday. I'm on Cameo as well, twitch.tv slash country code, watching the best of the 70s, 80s, and 90s commercials. Then I'm on Cameo, Cameo.com slash Pat Country for all your New Year's wishes, personalized uh, wishes uh, there. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. I'll explain why I personally switched it over. It's free. There's no monthly fees you have to worry about. There's also creation tools if you're starting out that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. So you don't need an expensive or complex setup to worry about there. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more podcast platforms. Listeners can also leave voice messages that you can listen to. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app right now or go to anchor.fm to get started. Uh, is GoldenEye coming back, Ian? Yes, so. GoldenEye, uh, I've got so a secret. I was sitting there the night that like this started to get passed around, but um, an Xbox achievement list for GoldenEye 007 uh, popped up. And um, that has led a lot of people to, I, I, you know, I think rightfully assume that GoldenEye 007 is heading to Xbox. It's it's strange because this is a game that people have wanted to see re-released forever and ever and ever. Um, whether you like it or not, and I, I'm not a huge fan, I understand the importance of the game. It was the first exposure for a lot of people in an era where computers weren't universal like they are now um it was their first exposure to maybe a first person shooter but also more importantly um multiplayer deathmatch which obviously remains wildly popular today and is the basis of you know just about all of the most popular money-making games that aren't sports games um we spoke about this about a year ago i looked it up about a year ago we spoke about how the xbox a uh, live arcade one that was basically finished over 10 years ago, never released. Yeah. More than that. It was like, yeah, it was like, Oh six, Oh seven. It was like 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, they never put it out. And the screenshots that people are showing that are attached to some of the achievements, I think it is people think that it's, it's likely going to be this version. I'm sure they're going to, you know, fluff it up, upscaled, et cetera. But yeah, I mean, from what I understand, there was a basically ready to go version of this game at one point. So, you, you know, can, yeah, I, I, gameplay video. There's a half hour gameplay on YouTube. Right. Of like the first um, half hour of the game. So I don't know what they did to get the rights finagled for this, but they hammered uh, something out because the, the problem with the rights to this is that you have rare involved. And then uh, I, I think Nintendo still might have some involvement in some scale, maybe just with the, the original being the original publisher. Just, and then you have uh, the Bond people who have the rights. To it. So you have like at least three parties that are involved with sorting this out. And right. now Microsoft owns Rare. So like you have two big video game companies, which it sounds like they almost worked something out between Microsoft and Nintendo way back. But it just felt 
there's too many there's too many too many you know cooks in the kitchen fingers in the pie yeah when it comes to this game which is a um, shame obviously there's so i i feel like nintendo and microsoft have been kind of nice nice with each other over the past couple of years yes so I could see them working something out. And then at that point, it really probably is just a matter of getting the rights from the Bond people. So, I, you know, at one point in time, this definitely seemed like an impossibility after the past couple of years, them doing the, you know, the, the cross play shaking of hands and shit like that. I, I guess I'm not entirely surprised. Um, I hope people enjoy it as much as they they. They think they will. I well, mean, we're hoping this is going to be like. If you look at the achievements, they're tied to like. It's isn't. This isn't like you know, like the 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 the, the we uh, remake Golden Eye in name only. It, it looks like no, no. This looks yeah. like the real deal. Yes, yes absolutely, one hundred percent. Complete dam. Complete bunker one. Complete silo. These are parts of the original incarnation of the game, not the not the Daniel Craig weird non remake version uh, that came out. It's also. Uh, it's going to be the 60th anniversary of James Bond appearing on the big screen this year. 1962 was Dr. No. So maybe the Bond people realize we can't be assholes. We got to do this. We got to spread and, some goodwill for our 60th anniversary. And now Nintendo, I think it was reported, they shut down the remake at the last minute. Last time. Maybe they're like, well, they're in a different, they have a better relationship now with, with Microsoft. Uh-huh. And maybe they realize this is good for us. We get a little piece of this. Maybe they also work out, you know what? Maybe you, maybe we can put the uh, N64 one on on the online service. That would go towards goodwill. So maybe there's some. Maybe they worked that out. That would not be shocking if they did that as well. Why not? Everyone wins. And the Bond people, mm. 60th, 60th anniversary. I mean, there's no movie coming out this year, but you know they're going to be celebrating all, all year. The movie just came out a few months ago. So yeah, no, I'm I'm happy for for everyone. And, and like that version looked good whenever it was developed around late 2000s. Yeah, I remember looking at that video and it looked real clean and the upscaling was nice. And I mean, that was ages ago. So, yeah. so they'll, they'll just, maybe they redid the textures. The gameplay is all there. It's probably the same engine. They'll just, they had better be the same engine and people will be pissed. I mean, I'll just up, upscale everything uh, on that. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens there. I don't think, it, I don't think this would come out on the Switch, but it's gone to my head. Maybe they worked that out. I think this would just be an Xbox thing. But um, yeah, that seems that seems maybe a little bit tougher. But it would be cool. It would definitely be cool if, if they worked that out on both. Yeah, I think I think this would, I think I think this would be a sort of a thing where Nintendo gets a gets a small piece of it, and then maybe they allow them to put the original one on the online servers. I think that you're right. That's probably far more likely. That's probably the best for all parties involved. Because I don't think it was even it wasn't on the rare replay pack things that they came out. Like they didn't have it on that. Oh no, no, no! Any any re, re, any true re release of the original Golden Eye would have been huge news. It, it hasn't been done yet. Sure. Uh, NFTs are big news. Man. Uh, fuck them. Um, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> how does he squ- really feel about it? <sighs> so I will always let you know. Um, Square Enix uh, president put out a letter over new year's and uh dove right into a whole lot of uh talk about nfts and how he uh will be bringing them in some way shape or form uh to square soft uh square enix in the future i i am so old that i constantly still refer to like square soft is square soft and enix is separate companies <laughs> from like 30 years ago yeah when they uh, by mid 90s so, uh in the late 90s yeah but like, i think 2000 was actually like the day that it happened um the letter that was sent out was gross and i'm looking for a specific quote um pulling it up right well, games now game spot article has a few of them that are interesting the the one that i want to point out is uh he says i realize that some people who play to have fun in quotes and who currently form the majority of players have voiced their reservations towards these new trends and understandably so however i believe there will be a certain number of people whose motivation is to play to contribute I, th- that whole first part, it's the first part, it's, it's gross. Play yeah. to have fun and who firmly, who currently form the majority of players. That's basically saying we hear you and we don't fucking care. We're doing it anyway because it's going to fill our pockets. It's, it's disgusting that we talked, we talked about this before other people that people that, you know, you follow, we follow on Twitter. Like you're, you're now having people play games for a purpose to 
It's like, it's not just, well, when you play a game, you're contributing to the health of the company by, by purchasing the game. Right. Or, or, or the, or the community of the game. You know what I mean? Now it's now after that initial point, you are now still working to contribute to the company, making the game via whatever the fuck NFT purchasing you're doing or whatever. I don't know if there's going to be like a, you know, a, a crypto thing involved with some of this where now you're helping line their pockets in a weird way that also has a really bad environmental impact on top of it. And it's just a really disgusting relation, regardless of the environmental impact. And this is the thing, the environmental impact is bad, but there's enough, there's a lot of people who are like, well, it's going to get clean soon. They've been saying that forever. No, I just read an article uh, that all, all the smart, uh, excuse me, all the like electric car use, all the gains on the, uh, from the energy were wiped out, I think by Bitcoin itself. Yeah, I or, saw or that. At least, or, or crypto wiped out the gains. I think it was the blockchain network and it, the blockchains in general. But um, they say it's going to get clean. But even if it doesn't, it, it's, it's, it's not offering anything to the game. And it's just a really gross way. It, it's, a, it, it's, it's forming a gross relationship with the company that you buy these games from. And it's, it's, it's like you owe them something this is beyond the initial purchase. And However, I hate that. With advances in token economics, token economics, users will be provided with explicit incentives, thereby resulting not only in greater consistency in their motivation, meaning to constantly play and basically put in work to get fucking tokens they could uh, try to sell an economy, but also creating a tangible upside to their creative creative efforts. No, just play the game and have fun. Not because now you're you're people that are going to obsess with trying to make money via playing these games and earning these fucking tokens to, to buy and sell. That's all this is. That's all this is. And you get if, people in MMOs that you know spend way too much time on them just to complete the game, and now you're you're preying on that mentality yes. even more. It's like put that time into you know doing something more fulfilling or hell, hell. If you want to make money, there's probably a lot more efficient ways of spending your time than doing this shit. But that's the thing they're going to try to make it. You're playing a game, so it's fun, right? It's going to be fun. People grinding away. <laughs> like on freaking MMO farms trying to get coins or I, like, that's not fun. No, exactly. And that's what it's all going to boil away. down to with any sort of game where you can earn what what's going to happen is the game is no longer going to matter. People are going to approach every game and they're going to look at it and they're like, how do I put in the minimum amount of time to get the maximum return? And it's just going to break down into people creating bots to play these games. It, it, it's, it's literally putting a coat of paint on what's already happening. Nothing is or, going to change. Or we get to that weird point in time where, where God, we're, 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 we're like rifling into a dystopia right now in some aspects, you're going to get to a point where games will be judged based upon what nft or what their token economy is like that'll be like part of a game's valuation not whether or not a game was actually well made and fun what's right. the token economy ian can i make 150 dollars for every 50 hours i play you know or whatever they'll like have it's discussed like it's there has to be like a revolt against this and i think it's half i think it will happen like this is insane and all the um all the uh sorry i just blanked um yep, our, fuck it nope lost it sorry. our lifestyles have changed and we are learning to coexist with covid19 against that backdrop i believe that the new technologies and concepts that i have discussed and the changes that they bring in our business environment will provide us with numerous opportunities to enrich people's lives through digital entertainment which is at the core of our business you can do that already Right, it's exactly. Things do already. It's like NFT is not giving you anything different. <laughs> it's insane. We do observe examples here and there of overheated trading in NFT-based digital goods with somewhat, somewhat speculative overtones. It's all speculation, regardless of the observed value of the content provided. This obviously is not an ideal situation, but I expect I expect to see an eventual right sizing in digital goods deals as they become more commonplace among the general public with the value of each available content corrected to their true estimated worth. And, and I look for them to become as familiar as dealing in physical goods. That's never going to happen because right now no one's buying in except the, the people that are trying to, uh, you know, fulfill the greater fool theory of buying this shit to flipping it. Right. The rest of us see right through this digital yes. things. I mean, if you have to I actually like went to the populace and asked a hundred average people about NFTs and, and digital goods, could you get even 
one person out of a hundred to probably say, oh yeah, I, I see the value in this and I see this making sense. I don't know if you can get one person. No, I don't, I don't know if you, I don't know if you could. And that's the thing, you know, uh, you look online at the, all the NFT talk, for instance, like on Twitter and these people who, who are pro NFT, they don't have a whole lot of backup, like out in the wild. Like if you ever see a person pop up in a regular old conversation thread, talk about NFTs, they might get like three likes or favorites or a retweet. Whereas everyone around them talking about the negatives is getting hundreds and hundreds of likes. They don't have they 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 don't have the the people power to promote this long term like it's just it's not it's not being adopted it's like you're not convincing people people are not buying into this it's almost like god this is probably an outdated reference you used to have like the rooms of people trying to like push penny stocks and calling people to buy stocks oh yeah and like and that's how you get your penny your penny stock up because yep. you already pre your company pre invested push that stock it's worth like 2 cents if we get it to 4 cents we doubled our money you right. Know, that's what this is. You yeah. Convince people that have, have no, they're not aware of it. To get, no, this is the new thing. This is it. Trust me because I already have my money into it. So you got to put your money in to raise my value. Then you're stuck holding the bet. That's all this is. That's all. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's disappointing seeing like the bigger companies, Ubisoft. And then I guess at some point, I guess people respect the Square Enix. Not so much as, I guess, after this. I, I guess so. Uh, I mean, one of the top comment on GameSpot uh, from someone named Jax. No matter how you look at it, this is the most tone deaf, insulting, demeaning, and disconnected thing he could have possibly said. He paints himself as such cartoonishly evil executive that it's practically pa- parody. Wearing his principles on his sleeve like this, it's enough to cons- convince me to stop supporting Square Enix entirely. It's a small gesture, but it's all that I can do, really. All I know is this guy is too disgusting for me just to do nothing. The irony of not doing something being more than nothing is not lost on me. And the timing, I think, is, uh, is, is suspect, too, because it's just a few weeks after um Endwalker came out the latest expansion to final fantasy 14 which started as a train wreck and has turned into supposedly one of the best mmorpgs people have ever seen and the fans for that game are rabid fans and i have a feeling like and, and they gained a lot of fans after the uh it gained a lot of fans after the activision blizzard stuff people kind of stopped playing wow and you know a lot of disgruntled wow players moved to final fantasy 14 well they just found their no game their their new game i have a feeling that a lot of people are going to talk negatively about this but i don't think anyone's going to adjust their playing habits or anything to to make a stance so you're so I, I think i think he realizes that he can come out and say this and because of the position they're in, especially with the popularity of one of their key games, uh, he can say, it, and they're probably not going to face many repercussions. I'd be surprised if any of the Final Fantasy 14 diehards out there really were like, okay, I'm done playing. So to them, they'll be like, well, we can play our future game, but also we can monetize and try to fuck each other over within the community about what, how much the stuff's really worth. That's basically it, what it, it comes down to. If it ends up in Final Fantasy 14, I think that's when people will revolt, but I don't think they'll, I don't think there'll be any boycott or or, uh, you know, people, you know, deleting their accounts just over this announcement. But that's where you're going to get this. That's where this is headed, though. You're going to have each right. of these games have their own little mini economy. Yeah. With the, with the player pool now having like, oh, built in built in trading and selling store. And, oh, you know, there's, there's this rare NFT I got. I can tr- I can sell to that asshole. Instead if I was a Final player, Fantasy 14 player, I would be very, very, very concerned about this. Sure. Because now it's like, well. Uh, is that rare, that rare, I don't know, armor that it's available in the game. Well, I can just buy it from the guy that the NFT version that a guy got. Like, right. that's what they're marching towards. Yeah. It, the, the end result of all of this is whoever has the most money is going to be the stronger person, strongest person in the game, unless they limit it to just cosmetics. And even that I find scummy. Yeah. Well, good times, right? Yeah. Friends, it's tough to have a small business and to keep things going smoothly, especially if you have to mail out things. That means you could be wasting a lot of time that's valuable going to the post office. Well, stamps.com makes it easy to mail and ship right from your computer. Save time and money with stamps.com. Send letters and packages for less with discounted rates from USPS, UPS, and more. They've been around since 98. I've been using stamps.com for about 10 years now. 
I've been mailing DVDs, T-shirts, Blu-rays, pins, and a lot more, and they've helped me out a lot. Stamps.com brings the services of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS shipping right to your computer, whether you're an office sending invoices, a side hustle Etsy shop, or a full-blown warehouse shipping out orders. Stamps.com will make your life easier. All you need is a computer and a standard printer. That's it. There's no special supplies or equipment needed. Within minutes, you're up and running, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send, and you'll get exclusive discounts on postage and shipping from USPS and UPS. Once your mail is ready, just schedule a pickup or drop it off. No traffic, no lines, no hassle. Cut the confusion out of shipping. With Stamps.com's new rate advisor tool, you can compare shipping rates and timelines to easily find the best option. Save time and money with Stamps.com. There's no risk. And with my promo code, CU Podcast, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage, and a digital scale, and no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in CU Podcast. That's stamps.com, promo code CU Podcast. Stamps.com, never go to the post office again. Ian, a yeah. topic came to our <laughs> topic came to our collective uh, notice our attention from, yes. from Chris Brew on twitter brew or broom i think that's an m it's an m okay yeah. just thought i'd tweet at you guys about this but ebay introduced what they're calling the collection beta beta looks like marketing is uh for cards right now but wouldn't surprise me if it expanded if popular to other media so when you click on the collection beta on ebay it's a little hub right now it's for sports cars it looks like it's time to level up. You can upload, manage, and track the value of up to 1,000 cards that you own, buy, and want all in one place. Get started by adding a CSV, which is a uh, comma delimited, uh, basically a spreadsheet or text file. Right. So what you'll love, eBay market value, the most accurate reflection of an item's current value based on verified transactions. List in seconds. The listings you create from your collection are pre-filled. So just review them and hit publish tools for management. A card sells every second. Keep up with tools for organizing, tracking value and more. So what eBay wants to do then is then integrate basically almost like a, like a price charting tool into their auction service. The same way on price charting, you can enter your entire collection. They want to do that, but they're going to be using their eBay prices in order to gauge and basically give you up to the second, literally up to the second, what your collection and individual cards are worth that you then can sell. Or I guess they'll probably then also have like a, a, yeah, they want to buy. So they'll have like a list that stuff you own, stuff you want to buy, stuff you're selling, you know? So this is like the next step forward that we've seen the past few years with, with obviously with card collecting, getting back in, into the, the new hotness uh, with, with the pandemic and, and probably Pokemon cards. They'll probably do at one point. So, I guess the question will be what will happen in your estimation if this comes to video games and game collecting? Um, I think it'll be interesting to see. So th- this, this makes sense to me. This is kind of like the um, natural evolution of all the collecting apps that we've had um, in the past. Uh, now it's basically that, but with an attached storefront to it. Um, I think it would make, I'm actually surprised, and I, I think it's just because they really have been hot since the pandemic. I'm actually surprised that they started doing this with sports cards first. Uh, I feel like maybe it's just because it's the you know the hobby I'm in, but I feel like video games would have made the most sense since we've seen explosive growth in video games. Uh, it, that, that was not related to the pandemic. We did have a lot of explosive growth related to the pandemic in video games, but video games had been growing uh, year over year in terms of their popularity, whereas up until the pandemic hit, sports cards had kind of fallen off. Someone can correct me. They ob- they definitely will if I'm wrong, but that's how I see it, so I'm surprised. Well, sports cards are a little probably might be more easier because you just have <laughs> yes. r- release year card number. That's it. You don't have all variants. You don't have, well, does it have the box or manual or not? You know, like it's Sure. And I, 
Right. And it's mostly going to be graded cards, you yeah. know, that are slabbed, you know, the, the, the one thing that that sort of thing actually makes a whole shitload of sense for. Um, so yes, there's a lot less variables involved, I think with, with cards. Um, I do think um, this will move to video games. Absolutely. I think it will take a few years. Um, I think it's a convenient thing. I don't know if it's necessarily good or bad, I think it will cause people to focus on the value of their games, uh, perhaps more so than anything else. And as a whole, it, it could really turn video games more into, uh, what's that term I hate, an alternate resource or something like that um, than it was in the past. Um, like, like, like basically an, another commodity that you own. Right. I have, a, it, it's going to cause, I think, I think, for some people, this is going to be great and they'll handle it. And I think for other people, it's going to cause them to commodify and focus on the value of their games more than anything else. At which point, I think that takes kind of the fun out of the collection. It's why I, I don't spend a whole lot of time looking, for instance, Disc, Discogs uh, basically already does this with records. Um, you can you know list all your records. It attaches, you know as long as you're filing them correctly the right print runs and stuff like that. It attaches a general, you can see what they're worth. You can pop it up on the marketplace for sale. Um, and I think a lot of people get involved in that and end up looking at the record collections almost as like a stock market or, uh, you know, any other investment market. And that kind of takes the fun out of it. I, I, I don't spend a lot of time looking at the value of my records. I'm always surprised and happy when I see I have one that's worth a couple hundred bucks. But, um, you know, I, I, I hate for that to be the focus of any hobby. Um, I think it's dangerous. Yes. Is why. I think, um, I, I, with, with a couple of clicks, you, you could have people buying to fill holes in their collection. Uh, and it's, it's impulsive. Well, well, there's a lot of reasons it's dangerous. I don't think eBay should be in the business of, of, of being a, a price guide, which is basically what this will become. I don't think they should be in the business of it. I think, it already is, though. I mean, but, but not de facto, not like this. Thing. Sure. This sure. is going to be, wow, it's, it's listed. Uh, as th this game is worth this much right now on the eBay market. Um, I don't think they should be in that business at all. I think it's unethical. Uh, I, I also feel like they need to, because they can be difficult to, uh, you got to really focus on the auction prices and not the buy it nows. And that's what I think is going to really skew the pricing of, of, of eBay. But even, the, but even the auctions can be manipulated with sure. shill bidding. And it's, it's the issue we have right now with right. these things on eBay is that they don't filter out stuff that's not paid for. When we, when we search completed listings, we see all the green listings, yeah. stuff that was uh, quote unquote bought. We don't know which ones weren't paid for. And sure. all that stuff potentially right now, when, when a seller looks at it or prices something out, say at a convention, they'll look at all the sold listings. There might be three or four in there that aren't, you know, and, and we, we've seen this happen, you know, in other markets for other collectibles where you can manipulate the market. You absolutely can do that. And so I don't think it's in eBay's interest to try to guard against that because they don't want their prices to go down. They want them to go up on all these things. That's because that's the, their bottom line. So I think it's, I think it's, I think it's as dangerous as someone like um, Wada trying to say what they think a game's going to be worth. They should be out of that market. They should be impartial. They should, they should just be the, the platform that you can buy and uh, buy and sell things. And that's it. I don't like that. Uh, sure. I don't like it's connected, connected to a price. Um, like you said, now it takes, takes the fun out of it. I, I think it's more, it's more nefarious because, the people are going to lean too much. They do it right now, but people lean too much on one source as being the, 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 the sort of the price range for a certain item. Um, the same way, like how, how like Beckett's guides came for sports cards, like in the nineties where that was like, well, if Beckett says that, well, you know, they have to source that from somewhere. And at least in the past, they sourced that stuff from a bunch of, they went to, before the internet, they went up and went to all the sports car conventions and people record them. Right. right now, you don't have people recording. And this is something I, I talked to uh, JJ Gaines about years ago, that you should really delve more into the private sale market and what's actually been happening for, and going to these conventions and seeing what stuff's actually selling for. Uh, that would be a lot more, it's a lot more work, obviously. And there's no incentive since they're not, they're not publishing a, a, a monthly video game price guide. That would be interesting. But there's no incentive to source out the, the, what things are being sold for actually in person. Like, shouldn't it count that I say a game that, that eBay sold for 100 bucks, I got for only 50 bucks out of convention because no one else wanted it? Shouldn't that count for something? I'm not saying everything, that should count for something. 
You know, like it's, going to PRGE and seeing what stuff is selling for there should count for something in, in the grand scheme of this. Um, so that's not happening. And that will never happen uh, when, it, when it comes to how these things are priced out. And I think it's a shame. So I, I, I see it. I don't, I don't, I, I see it be fun to track what your collection is quote unquote worth, but yeah, it, it's just, it's just, I think it's bad news overall. And I don't think I'm being alarmist. I just look at the natural progression of how these things work out. Sure. You know? Yeah. I mean, any, any way that these sorts of things can be manipulated, um, uh, they, they will be at this point. Yeah. I, I mean, would it be nice if I can get my right now it's in Google sheets make it a CSV and upload it. And, and, I, and I guess, and I guess see how effective this tool would be to automatically saying, well, you have, these are Sega Saturn games. This is what they're worth. You have, you know, you have uh, these mass system games, you have these NES games and then seeing it come out and parse it out. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. And then I can click a button to, to, to list them. I just don't think eBay should be in that business. That's it. I, or at the very least m- be able for me to upload, upload everything. Um, and then maybe after I click on an individual item, you can get the, okay, here's your preferred, or here's the buy it now range of what's happening. I don't, I think it's a lot. I think they should have that hidden behind it, another layer, not just have, oh, here's all the prices laid out. I, I just don't like that. I think that information should be more hidden, but they won't. Obviously. Would you, up, would you upload some games in to see what they're worth? He's muted. Sorry, I was coughing and I forgot to unmute. Um, I mean, maybe just for interest, but at the same point in time, I, I don't want to get rid of it. And it, like I said, with the records, the more I look at that stuff, the more I'd be tempted to um, potentially unload it. And I don't need the temptation. I like the stuff that I have. I'm buying less stuff, but I don't necessarily want to get rid of it. And, you know, seeing all those numbers there, it makes it really easy to be like, really? 500 bucks? All right, fine. Get rid of it. You know, if it sells for that, I mean, obviously. Right. Yeah. If it sells. I, 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 I'm happy just looking up individual games when I'm, when I, uh, when I want to know what they're worth. Like I said, I, I don't do a whole, I, I do that with a collection already. I do it with all my records and I, I don't look at it a, a ton. I just don't see the point. Did you, did you see like a, like a, like a major shift in how people come on ties uh, the records after they started adding those features or those features have been around for a, a while. And I think Discord uh, discogs is pretty good about, I, I, I feel like the marketplace is pretty fair to be honest with you. Um, but I'm sure there were growing pains with it, but they've been doing this sort of thing forever and ever. Sure. All right. Well, I guess we'll see when they start rolling this out for obviously it'll be Pokemon cards next. Cause that's just like sports cards in terms of the, the ease of listing things um, even easier because it, it's not different companies or brands. It's just, that's true. Pokemon yeah. cards. I, I think, I think seeing this for Pokemon cards, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, magic that probably makes sense next um i think comics make a lot of sense um sure uh because again that's still easy a little bit easier and then maybe video games i feel like it's inevitable that this will happen for video games but i think that is toys uh, maybe toys is i think even harder than video games think so, so I don't yeah think, i don't think it's harder well really no nah, maybe a lot not. less volume you know. sure and you still have you still have variants, but like not nearly the probably the variants of video games. I would think I'm trying to think like Star Wars figures. You'd have like you know say Boba Fett. You'd have the you know the, the Star Wars card, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi card, Space versus Desert. So there's like five different variants or so or six. Don't kill me, st- toy nerds. I know some of this stuff. Um, so I'll top of my head, but you know what I mean. Like you have to track track for all the variants. That's why the card thing to me is like it's the card. That's it. It's it's it, here's it's a chase card, but that's it. There, there's not like seven variants of this, you know, chase card. It's the chase card with it's number four of a hundred or whatever that you put in your own info. But games, I guess we'll see. Yeah, I guess we'll see. There's just too much. We don't we don't even have a good. We're still not in a space where we have, you know, a grading system for for unopened game. For example, for open games, we don't have a grading system for. Yeah, I was going to say that kind of just stop. It hasn't matured to that range where people will say, okay, you have a complete box game. What's what's the actual grade on this? Is it a nine? Is it a seven? Is it we don't have that? Well, we'll see, Ian, as as we you know, I don't know. Every, everything's for sale nowadays, so we'll we'll get there. Yeah. Uh Ian, uh, we got a Patreon, don't we? 
We do patreon.com slash CU podcast. You go, you exchange money. You get the full video podcast uh, writings. I will do one this week, I promise. Uh, Hangouts, probably about a week and a half until our next hangout. Uh, You get the bonus podcast segments and you get to vote in user polls just like this one. Well, this this is a fun poll. This is going to be a close one. Uh, in, in, in second place, <laughs> are sealed game co- collectors being mistreated? 40%. In first place, free space. Happy New Year. 60%. But guess what? <laughs> this is why democracy can be a mob. We're going with our sealed game collectors being mistreated. An article that was written now months ago, that which actually kind of dovetails off the last topic, kind of worked out. So the, the link's down there below, Ian, uh, for future topics. So this comes from Input Mag. Uh, this was an article under the capitalism, um, I guess, section from Chris Stokel Walker. The retro video game market is bonkers. Some suspect foul play. What's behind the massive surge in prices that has upset small time collectors? Already you're couching that it's small time collectors. What, because we don't have the money? Am I, would I be considered a small time collector, Ian, just because I'm not into great games? I don't think so. But that, that's, that, but I'll get on the, the author later for that. He probably meant well. Um, Talks, it starts with about talking about Charles Reed, uh, always liked games, but you know, a small collector, not into the graded stuff. And, and they're saying it's gotten out of control. The market's changing. This article brings up the, the, the July, uh, now infamous Mario 64 going for 1.5 million. Um, that was July already. Jeez. Yeah, that was half a year ago, Ian. Fuck. If you have this article open, they spoke to Carl Jobs. So this video came out after the first video and before the second one that came out. Uh, in December of September. So this, this article was probably written then, I want to say late September, early October was probably written. Uh, Job said it's all a song and dance. He told Input, it's all completely fake. The more I looked at it, the more I realized, yeah, there's something going on here. Right. Heritage and Water have denied all the allegations. Separately, journalist Seth Abramson has made similar allegations of collusion between the two, and maybe a couple of dumb podcasters have for years as well. Uh, maybe. Job's tells Input he's making a follow-up video, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, Valerie McLeckley of Heritage Auctions responded. I've met Valerie, very, very nice uh, person, but I disagree with her uh, here on a couple of fronts here. Um, the implication is that ordinary gamers are being cut out of their hobby because of the inflated prices. Far from it, says those involved. Uh, that's sort of the normal progression of any collectible market, says Valerie McLeckley of Heritage Auctions, which runs weekly Tuesday night video game auctions, blah, 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 blah. As there is a boot in interest, there are certain pieces that people get priced out on. So I think I think the what Carl would disagree with is what we call the normal progression. And I think any sane person watching this market, even people that are bullish, would say this is not a normal progression. It was too quick to be a normal progression. It didn't happen in decades. It happened in a matter of, say, 18 months where it just spun out of control. And I think that's what we get on when we talk about this stuff is that uh, you, you had a, a collective make this happen. Uh, there was no natural rise in prices. When you, when you track comic books, Star Wars figures, baseball cards, those progressions you saw happen slowly over time, over the decades. With, with these uh, graded games, even before the graded games, because graded games have been around, they were around before uh, WADA and before Heritage Auctions, they, they were worth more, but not like this. So if you wanted to track it, from then, you could have said, okay, 2000, whatever the first VGA game was, like 2008 or nine, for the first 10 years, yeah, they probably went up a little bit, but not like through to the moon, uh, as, they, as they said there. Right. Um, sure, we have seen in the media the tremendous results that have been achieved on the free market, but that's because they are so tremendous, she adds. Uh, if a gamer wants to pick up a loose cartridge of a game to collect, they, they still... Could that's what the article says, and this is where I this is where I I I I, I take I, I get offended by this stuff. Um. Uh, by the way, they denied uh, Carl Job's uh, allegations. They're completely unsupported. Of course, they don't say how they're unsupported. And this is where this is where I take issue with Valerie at this point. Across other collectible hobbies, it's not uncommon for there to be sour grapes when third party authentication begins to become popular. Sour grapes. So I, I, when, you, when you mention that, I think what you're doing is you're discounting any valid criticism of what's been happening or, or any concerns you may have by saying, well, it's just people that 
uh, don't like what's happening for the sake of it. And that's it. And I think there is some of that, but I don't think that's all of it. And I think it's disingenuous to imply that it's all of it. And this is why we've always talked about, you know, sealed games has always been a, a, you know, a, a point of contention. Yes. Forever. Uh, I, I argue with people about it, uh, you know, on Nintendo age, about some of these people that were involved with some of these sales now, eventually. And it was a, dis- a fundamental disagreement about what game collecting is. It wasn't necessarily sour grapes. And people have had issue with, issues with seal collecting way before the prices sh- uh, shut up to these insane amounts that you know something fishy is going on. So you, you want to call it sour grapes. Yeah, but it, this happened before. It had nothing to do with the pricing on these games. It had to do with the, the thought and intention behind it. So my argument always was that this wasn't true game collecting because if you wanted to collect games, you wouldn't be satisfied with any complete in-box copy or any cartridge. And at that point, what happened is you are valuing the cellophane versus the, the actual game itself at that point. Like it takes over at some point. That's what drives you. The actual game doesn't matter. It's, the game itself matters a lot less than, than the condition. Condition becomes first and foremost the reason you are collecting. That right. was always my argument when it came to it. You're collecting condition. You're not collecting games anymore. Sure. Yeah. No, that's very true. Um, then they brought up our pal Eric Nyerman, who was 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 in a couple of these articles. Carl Jobs featured him. He is the dentist. They always got to bring up the dentist in Florida. <laughs> and when this individual comments on our videos covering this, uh-huh. uh, I, I I think it's him. He has to put Eric Nyerman DDS as his name. Like it's very gives- strange. I just don't get that. Like anyone gives a shit that you're in people's mouths all day. Like we don't right. know that when you're commenting, but whatever, Eric. Um, so this article says he spent the last several years buying some of the, not several years, like two and a half, not several years. It wasn't yeah. buying games before uh, WADA and heritage auctions were doing this. Um, he spent the last several years buying some of the world's rarest games for millions of dollars. No, no, no. His conglomerate LLC has See. been buying these games. Yeah. Which is why he's not again, a real collector. A real collector doesn't go to his rich friends and neighbors. Hey, I need money for a startup to buy games. That, Ian, have you ever asked your friends for money to buy a bunch of games at one time? I don't think I've done that. Yeah. I don't think uh, you talk to game collectors. I don't think that that's a thing they've done. You know? Um, I mean, he says, I've been very, very transparent about it. I tell people really? it's financially driven and it's also collector driven. I'm a true collector at heart. I really am. Anyone who says shit like that is already trying too hard to convince other people. Just admit you're in this for the money and the numbers and you're not in it for the games. I'm a true collector, even though I only started doing this when I thought I could realize profitable gain. I, you know, I'm a collector. Um, even though I wasn't buying these games 10 years ago for pennies on the dollar versus now, that's how much I love this stuff. That's the argument I always come back to. You really love this stuff. Why didn't you buy it even five years ago when you could have got the stuff for 1% of the value? You could have got all, you could have got all the sealed Mario 64s uh, to, to your heart's content for like 150, 200, $300. You could have bought them all if you loved them that much. Um, it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. I'm a true collector at heart, I really am, but this has become its own animal. Uh, as the stakes get higher and higher and people put money in, into the hobby. It's not a hobby. It's, it's, a, it's a collectibles market, I would say. That's what it is. And, here's, and this is where I'm going to draw the, the, the title of the clickbaity title from. Um, Narman reckons a lot of the criticism of big value collectors is driven by desire to be in their place. A lot of people are very judgmental just based on envy and jealousy. Envy and jealousy. And they force themselves to be very close-minded to people who are doing things differently how they do it. Envy and jealousy of the of the dentist and his and his uh, and his cohorts. There is it envy and jealousy because of the of the money being made or of the it's not of the stuff being collected. Because obviously, people like me and you could have bought the sealed games anytime we want to. I still can buy sealed games. I have I have the cash to buy some sealed games. I could. I just don't agree with it. That's obviously why I don't. Um, and here, this is what you're going to love, Ian. Nyerman draws a link between the way he and others have been treated and cancel culture. <laughs> That's how I feel like I've been treated in some corners of the market. If you don't collect how I collect, you shouldn't be collecting at all. Okay. Cancel culture. So now anytime you have criticism of someone at all and, and, and they're, and we'll just say weird, uh, lying ways of saying they're a collector and starting LLCs to, to uh, tr- try to put money in your pocket in the pockets of your friends. 
Now it's all cancel culture. Do you believe, do you think that's true, Ian? No, I, I mean, I don't really believe in cancel culture in general. You look around and not many people who have whined about being canceled have actually been canceled by anything. Uh, Eric, Eric, have you been canceled at all? Are people uh, getting less crowns and caps at, at your business now? Uh, be, be less dental work because, because of some collectors are, are saying we disagree with your scummy ways. Is, is, uh, are you really being canceled, buddy? I, I, I don't think you're being canceled, buddy. You probably still have your, your house, you know, you, you, that you've made off of people getting dental implants. I think you're doing fine. I think you're doing okay. It's a very traumatic change to change a hobby into a market. <clears throat> this is how you know Eric's not a collector. It, there's always been a video game market. Oh, right. Wait. Even 20 years ago, there's been a market for this stuff. There's always been the hard to find games. There's always been the games that are worth more. Stadium events was always hard to find and people wanted it. It was worth more. The NWC carts were always worth more even 20 years ago. They weren't worth what they're worth now, but they were always worth the premium. They were always worth the games at the premium. And you know that. Yes. You know that. It's not a traumatic change. The only change is the motivation behind it. Before it was drawn from a place of wanting to collect games either because they were scarce or because they had some historical notoriety like the NWC carts or a Mr. Boston on Vectrex is always a weird one that I wish I owned. You know, like that's what, where we drew, you know, the, 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 the pricing of this stuff came from naturally. Yeah. There's been video game. There's been retro game conventions for at least 11 years now. The first one was either Portland or, or, or Seattle, but I think Portland was, was the first one. Um, there's always been a market for this stuff. It, this is a very just, I wish, I wish the author of this article pushed back on that because that's not what the issue is. There's always been a market for this stuff. What a stupid, dumb uh, statement to say. I spent, I spent f- uh, four figures on a golden WC card. There's, no, there's never a market before this. Are you fucking crazy? Sure. It's, it's insane. <laughs> Four figures. What is it? Four? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, five figures. Five figures. I've, I spent four figures on one, five figures on the other. Uh, Pat Math. Yeah. There's no market, though, Ian. There's no market. Um, as one of the aggrieved read uh, aims, this is the collector, aims his ire less at the collectors and more at the cash they're flashing. I, I, I don't care about the, the cash they're flashing. I don't really care about that. Again, it's the intent and motivation behind it. If these were people that truly cared about this stuff and didn't just look to, to flip it to the next idiot behind them and leave them holding the bag, I would have less issue with it. If people honestly, and you, like Ian, you, you've, we've met a couple people that honestly like sealed game collecting and they, they've been around, but this new wave are not even them, the people I disagree with. They're not that at all. Uh, Jobs uh, says, stresses his, that he's not saying that video games shouldn't be worth millions and collectors are only hurt by this if the price of games go, goes up. He adds, what I was saying is that I don't believe the current spike in video games was organic. And I believe the ethics involved were poor. Therefore, I don't believe the current market is real, which is like 99% of people are agreeing with uh, at this point. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with that. I, I agree that, that, um, that the, it just doesn't seem like it was an organic spike. Uh, finally, Valerie McLeckley said, uh, video games have tremendous potential I'm guessing to mean to go up more in price. Uh, at the end of the day, video games are the most consumed format of media in existence. We celebrate the release of AAA titles to agree that's even more intense than blockbuster movies. And because of that, people will continue to pay high prices for rare graded games. That's the author's tag on the end. Uh, I think it's interesting that obviously her boss is involved with a lot of this. So Valerie can't talk about her boss being involved uh, allegedly with, you know, with price manipulation and being involved with the grading house. But like it's it's an inconvenient truth that exists there. Sure. Um, and and it's one what of those is that? that. What's that? I just heard a pop. Was that Zoom or? You heard a pop? Yeah. I didn't hear a pop again. Oh, okay. Well, on your that's side. Um, that's the bubble bursting potentially. <laughs> so yeah, so this is what we want to discuss. Um, you're always going to have now people butting heads when it comes to this, but to, to say something is just born out of envy and jealousy is kind of weak. And to say that there's never been a gay market uh, before this stuff has been happening is just, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's either it's naivety, it's ignorance and or lying. And I wish this author point out that that was just factually incorrect. 
That's yeah. just objectively false to say that. There's always been valuable games. There's always been people buying and selling uh, video games for. Yeah, it. that's it's not new. I mean, all the way back to Atari stuff. Yeah, when you're, when people were spending fifty bucks for just a complete box, you know, centipede game, you know, back then, you didn't seen that. Mm-hmm. Anything else to add? No, nothing really. I'm glad that we got to cover that and we got to get it out of the system. <laughs> Do you see why now? Do you see now why people on at patreon.com slash see your podcast? We want to speak about that. Uh, all right, Ian, we got we got voicemails. Go to anchor.fm slash to see your podcast and you can uh, you can listen to some fun voicemails. Try to keep them short and sweet. Like 20 uh, minutes is good. You don't deflate us to say, hey, here's my question. Here you go. Let's do uh, let's do 10 minutes here. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Phil Bo a.k.a. Phil Bowser again. Question for both y'all is, what do you think are some good NES to Game Boy ports that translated well? Mm -hmm. Uh, Specifically for Ian, follow-up, just discovered Mole Mania. What are other Game Boy games that you think needed to be remade nowadays? And for Pat, I know you love the NES Max. Mm -hmm. What are the best games on the NES to play with that? Thanks. Take care. The best games to play on the NES Max would be Anything that requires sort of constant movement, um, a game like ice hockey, where you're constantly moving your skate around, any track and field two is a good one, especially for circular motions. Those are the games that the NES Max excels at, where you need less super precise movement and more constant fluid motion. Uh, I would say that uh, some sports games, but not all like a hockey game would be more so that you can't use them on platformers. It, it just doesn't work out uh, on that. Yeah, no, it sucks on platformers. Or even, um, a, even a game like Top Gun, a, a Max is useful for. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm kind of blanking on the NES to um, uh, Game Boy Advance ports, but I mean, the, the the easy one for me to pull up is Super Mario 3 Advance with all the cool um, e-reader levels. Or just, huh? Did he say Advance or just Game Boy? Uh, NES to Game Boy ports, sure. So I guess, yeah, it doesn't, uh, it could be anything. Like your, um, your, your Burger Time? and <laughs> uh, I mean, Burger Time is just a different version of the game. It's fantastic, oh, yeah. though. I think it's, I think it's the best version of Burger Time, 100%. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful game. Um, and then in terms of stuff like Mole Mania, I think Mole Mania should probably, yeah, Mole Mania would be great for a remake. I also want to see more Mario Picross games. Um, I love Picross. Yeah, it's it's surprising that they didn't, you know, continue as on as much as they, they should have. I know they came out with what, another one. I mean, there's all sorts of like downloadable Picross games, but I want to see another like heavily Nintendo theme. That's what yeah, that's what I mean. Like it's easy for them to do a game like that. Why yeah, just throw it out there. It's sort of like a lost in time thing, Picross, right? Uh, next one. This is from oh, it's from a Patrick. Hey guys, this is Pat from New York. This question is for Ian. Mm. I've had the habit. I've also had Burger Lounge. You know, decent options. Two burgers I'd recommend if you ever get the chance is Craigie on Main in Boston, Massachusetts, and Burgers Never Say Die in Los Angeles. Ooh. But my question for Ian is, what the hell did Five Guys ever do to you? <laughs> Five Guys is pretty solid. Yes. I'm going to go with Pat on this one. What's the, uh, what's the beef? Thank you so much. What's the beef? What's Every time I've had the, the, they're they're overly messy burgers. They're sloppy. Yeah. I don't think they live up to the hype. And sometimes when I order a fucking small fry, I just want a fucking small fry. Don't load my goddamn bag. You're complaining about free fries. Portion control, man. <laughs> <laughs> throw, throw them out to the birds. Uh, get get to our local five guys. I have they've never been too sloppy. The last time I got the, the one time I tried in one week, I tried Burger Lounge and the Habit in one week. One of the two I keep forget was the super sloppiest burger, and the and the bottom bun was like a fucking sponge; it fell apart and, and disintegrated. Uh, it took uh, it was terrible. That was a I never had a sloppy Five Guys burger personally, but you also can you can choose the less toppings too, if you want. Oh god, now I'm fucking starving. Intermittent fasting. I'm hungry myself. Uh, next one here. Hey guys, love the podcast. This is Andy from Los Angeles. Um, I have an interesting question for you guys. I myself am a retro collector, born in 81, lived through the generations of collect, you know, playing video games, collecting video games. But I'm just curious if you guys experienced the uh, Toys R Us ticket system. I uh, want to hear thoughts on how Toys R Us sold video games and the nostalgia behind that, if you guys had that experience. Every kid had that experience, Andy. Like, that's, yeah. that's what it was. Most kids got their games at Toys R Us. I mean, you had Kitty City, you had KB, but like, Toys R Us was it was dominant 
uh, more by the late eighties into the early nineties. And you had the ticket system. It was just huge aisles of like five or six up. You couldn't reach the top ones. If you were a kid, you grabbed the ticket, you bought the ticket, you went to the, the big vault in the back with the big glass things where they kept even like back in the day, they, that's where they even kept uh, like, the, like, like the, like the cabbage patch kids were back there. Other, other certain toys were back there, but that's where all the video games were. Cause they didn't want people stealing them. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, of course, remember it. Uh, I, I loved going and grabbing the ticket and taking it up to the counter and getting the game. Um, but I can't imagine that it was a very great system either. I'm sure tickets went missing all the time. And uh, there were probably, you know, copies in the that were available for purchase yes. that there were no tickets for. So it always made sense to go and ask if you looked and like there wasn't a, a ticket for the game. Sometimes they would still have stuff back there because the tickets would go missing. A kid would grab a ticket and then the mom would be like, no, you're a shitty little brat. You can't have it. And um, yeah, it, you know, it, it wasn't ideal. Yeah. Like someone like Kevin would take the ticket home for his like Super Mario 2. Right. It's like, you know, Kevin, it, uh, some other kid might want that game. So their parent, he goes home crying because he took the fucking ticket out. Right. None left there, you little piece of dog shit cheating at Tecmo Bowl. Sorry. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Now, it, like I said, Ian said it wasn't ideal, but like they can't have all the games out. Just right. make them willy nilly, uh, you know. Almost no one did that. I and mean, even even at KB, they had him pegged up behind the counter. And at Kitty City, they had him pegged up behind the counter. You say, "Oh, give me that game." Maybe that would have been a different system. But like, those were a lot smaller stores, uh, especially KB. The mall was a lot smaller than a Toys R Us. You couldn't have one person running from all, between all the different game consoles. <laughs> They'd be going nuts around Christmas. It would be like a free for all. Yeah. Hey guys, Leland from Lelanders calling all the way from an icy wasteland we call Canada. If you could bring back and enhance any video game peripheral from the past and make it real under your Christmas tree this year, what would it be? Would you want a pimped out power glove to use in today's VR? A better NES robot? Or maybe a Sega hologram machine from the arcade classic Time Traveler? Oh. One that could play video games and live sports like WrestleMania. Thanks again. Uh, what the oh little vocoder <laughs> uh what what i want is um i, I want a light gun that works on fucking hd tvs that's all that's all i want i want to be able to play light gun games again that's but, what i want i mean you could with the with this switch joy con in theory just like pointing it doesn't action. feel the same though does it feel the same as like no like a wiimote did I, yeah i don't think it feels the same i want an actual light gun again they could they could do one like if they wanted to, like using that Joy-Con or pointing tech or we pointing tech. They could, or whatever is going on with the one that uh, Sindon, the Poly Mega one. I mean, I've heard decent things about that. I don't know a lot about it, but I think it's pretty much attached to them right now. Hey, Pat, and any plans for an 11th NES marathon? We'll see. Yeah. My life's got to get a lot better and, and, and less stressful to, for, uh, for it to come back. That's all I'm going to say. Not this year. Oh, yeah, not, not 2021. We missed that year for sure. Well, yeah, and I don't know about next year. Hello, Pat and Ian. My name is Greg, and I'm from Vancouver, Canada. I worked for McDonald's for uh, almost nine years. Thankfully, I quit, and I'm several years removed. But what I can tell you is Pat is completely correct about the varying quality of McDonald's from country to country. A very stark example of this is in certain countries, McDonald's sandwiches are advertised as burgers. If you'll notice in the U.S. specifically, they're, they're advertised as sandwiches because there isn't enough uh, burger stuffs in the burger patties to consider them burgers. This goes for Canada for many of the burgers with the exception of the quarter pounder, which is actually advertised as a burger. Pink slime is an American only thing and not something that you could get away with in Canada or Sweden or Japan or many other parts of the world. The chicken nuggets, as far as I'm concerned, are inedible outside of Canada because they literally taste metallic. That's all I really have. If you want to know more about McDonald's, just let me know and I, I can spew all kinds of knowledge, including why the ice cream machines are always broken. All that being said, cheers. Thank you, Greg. I, I, I thank you. The, from, this, from the horse's mouth himself, the burgers vary in country to country. All right. You get the shit burgers. And I know why about the ice cream machines. This is why. Uh, the ice cream machines... Um, this was an article I saw like last year or some 2021 is that they only have one company that services them uh -huh. on almost like on purpose. It's uh -huh. so like, they're always backlogged. And so like, it just seems like a really bad, almost like scummy 
like system that's involved with their ice cream machines. That's that's at least what I was. I was like weird, oh, weird, very strange. Like they only have certain technicians come out. Like you can't have anyone just do it. And so it's like mm, there's something weird going on here. There's some inside dirty dealing with McDonald's <laughs> and like the ice cream, uh, you know, tech going on. It's it's, it's really. It's really weird here. I'll right, we'll do a, a couple more here. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm from Bavaria. The guy you just called out about the tax monies from the Miko. I think people should be educated enough, but many people aren't. So, what you are doing is quite good. But I think those people who are buying the Amicos mostly don't care or don't look up information in the beginning. So, if they fail to look up information, it's their fault. So keep up your work, but I don't think it would change anything. Oh uh, yeah, I, I mean, people don't care. People just want their nostalgia console from 40 years ago. That it's only the same company. It's not the same company, and there's no connection to the original. But hey, I played it when I was uh, five back in '80, and now I'm you know 47, and I want another one. Right. Uh, you know, it's not the same one, and you know, taxpayers be damned. Investors, ah, who cares if investors get fleeced? Because I want to feel fuzzy like I'm still in my underoos playing this stuff <laughs> 43 years ago where the hell this console came out. That's what it is. That's what it comes down to. And it, it's sad. And it is what it is. And it really, there's almost like, there, like it's almost like I want to see like a sociological write-up on this whole th- phenomenon. Like that's really what it comes down to. Happy New Year, Pat and Ian. This is Karen N. Hi, Karen. Hi, Hi Karen. Hello. The whole world has to know. This is absolutely critical. Are sealed game collectors being mistreated? <laughs> thanks. Hi, uh, Karen. Thanks, uh, writer for a future N64 guy book and a, and a good person. Uh, I, you have to listen to the previous segment for that, Karen. Yes. I right, want to do one more. Uh, sure. So, if I am to understand you gentlemen correctly, <laughs> Now you're basically just taking calls from any schmuck who says he's Tommy Tallis. <laughs> How is that supposed to make you feel? Having someone call into a podcast pretending to be me. You don't check his credentials or nothing. Just, oh, hey, Tommy Tallarico, let's put him through. What's wrong with you? But I'm pretty sure the listeners knew it wasn't me. Because that guy sounded like a con artist, a liar, an egomaniac. Does that sound like me? But you know, while we're on the topic, Ian, it sounded like you were accusing me of lying about people actually winning that golden ticket contest for a free system. And you said, I sounded like I'm nervous. I'm not nervous. Where do you get that idea? You're just imagining things. So I'm going to read you the list of winners right now, okay? Steve Rogers, Reed Richards, Falco Lombardi, Oswald Cobblepot, Luigi Vitelli, and uh, Robocop. Now don't you feel stupid? Don't you feel dumb, Ian? Yeah, I do. I feel real dumb now. Robo- um, how, how RoboCop came up like twice today? Yeah, weird. And then I watched RoboCop one and two were playing on uh, one. Of, I think it was like on Comet Network. It was it was playing last week, and I, I forgot how awesome RoboCop is. Oh, it's an amazing movie. The second one I haven't seen all. Of. I got to go back and watch the second one. The first two have Peter Weller, and the third one. Like, I've only ever seen the first one. And there was like two or three different, there was two different television series, which both, I think both or at least one had um, his sidekick in it. Uh, she was in one or both series in like the early 90s. And then there was like a, they tried to do like a mini Robocop revival. There was toys. And there was a cartoon. Oh, yeah. They tried to like kidify it besides yep. the video game. Very strange. This is a, this is a violent Verhoeven film, which was like, you know, a critique on modern society. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> And, which had action in it in a RoboCop. Uh, lots of movies like that were weird in the 80s, like just marketed to kids with no idea of their content because, I mean, a RoboCop is going to sell the kids. Yeah. Well, there was also those Aliens figures that came out uh, in the early 90s, and it was like, there was no cartoon. I think they tried a pilot, but like, they had all these Alien figures and became a line in the 90s, far after, you know, yeah. Alien 3 had come out, but like, it was based on the 86 Yep. Uh, film, but like this was like years, several years later. Oh, I know. My brother had one. They were great, those figures. Yep. Well, that's it for the CU podcast. That's it. Thank you. For you did a lot better this week me. versus last week, Ian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like I said, I'm improving slowly it's but only surely. Cost, only cost about, cost about eight times versus about 75. Like last time. So you're doing no. better. All, All right. right. Hopefully next week I'll, uh, I'll be there with you. 
All right. We'll watch, All right. We'll watch that NES Punk episode if you haven't seen it. Game Boy Christmas game. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.